Christian, Victor, can you just speak for a second on your phone so we know which call-in you are? Steve and Victor, can you unmute yourself and talk for one second so we can identify you? Um, welcome to the Reef Resilience webinar on learning exchanges, creative collaboration for increasing effective management. My name is Petra McGlynn. I'm the project manager for Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Program, and I'm going to be the host for the session. The webinar is brought to you through the generous support of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to let you know how the agenda will work for the webinar. Basically, we start with presentations from our panelists, and then at the end of the webinar, we do questions from those of you participating in the webinar. There's days you can ask questions. You can use the chat box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions to the webinar host, and we're going to keep track of those questions for the end of the session. Another way to ask questions are raising your hand during the question and answer period, and we'll take your question in the order it was received. If you raise your hand, you click on the small hand icon at the bottom of the list of participants that you see there in your webinar box. Any technical difficulties, trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can also use the chat box to talk to the host and let us know, and we can work on trying to resolve those. So introduce and welcome our presenters. Manuel Mejia has been TNC's Hawaii Community-Based Marine Probe Manager for the past six years. Prior to that, he managed Tubata Reefs, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the Philippines for World Wildlife Fund, and coordinated the locally managed marine areas network across the Asia-Pacific region. He also spent time as an analyst with the Biodiversity Conservation Network, a USAID-funded project, examining how nature and community-based enterprises impacted biodiversity conservation throughout Asia Pacific. His past are people and our oceans, and he's at McGill and Columbia Universities, where he focused on natural and earth sciences and environmental policy. Presenter with with Manuel is going to be Kevin Victor, He's a regional conservation planner for TNC Micronesia with a master's in marine biology. His research interests include coral reef biology, MPAs, and evaluating anthropogenic disturbances on reefs. He's interested in bridging the science to communities that will help them make appropriate decisions regarding natural resource management, as well as learning about the traditional knowledge and wisdom that communities have with respect to their resources and the natural environment. And our third presenter is Angela Hiile Cavello. She's a native of Kalu, Oahu, and has been the executive director of Paipei Pai Ohia, a nonprofit organization dedicated to caring for ancient Hawaiian fish pond located on the island of Oahu. She's been executive director since 2007, previously serving as an educator, facilities manager, and restoration coordinator for the organization. He was raised in Ka'alu by her skilled fishing family and has been a student to the art and science of fishing and Kanhe Bay her entire life. She is a graduate of Punahou School, received her Bachelor of Arts in Zoology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and strives to serve the community through the work she does at Heia Fish Pond. So I'll turn over the presentation to Manuel and Stephen, I believe, who will be starting us off, and again for presenting. Um, this is Manuel, um, mm -hmm. Ali, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, very fortunate to be joined by my friends and colleagues, uh, Stephen and Hiile. Um, so the first slide, we just want to show you kind of a, a quick outline 
of our presentation. And so before we cast off lines on our boat, uh, we to give a, an introduction, a brief introduction on learning exchanges, uh, their purpose, uh, also kind of a review of the two learning exchanges that we did with Po in Hawaii um, to give you kind of uh, a context and background. Um, focus will be on reflecting on best practices uh, and lessons learned during this trip. Uh, it's by no means exhaustive, but um, Hopefully, though, some of it will be useful. Third, we'll, we'll briefly discuss measuring outcomes and potential impacts as a result of these learning exchanges. And fourth, uh, we're fortunate enough to have Hile uh, present her perspective uh, on the trip, kind of a first-person view, someone outside TNC who could uh, talk about what the trip meant to her and how we could improve upon future ones. And lastly, take, uh, we'll field questions at the end. So what learning exchanges and, and why did we approach um, uh, learning exchanges this way between Hawaii and Palau? Well, well first of all, uh, um, learning exchanges are um, are going to be different each time you do it and wherever you do it. Um, and actually, it's an opportunity for any group to come together around an agreed upon topic that they want to learn about. And in case, it was to learn about different conservation approaches hand in both Pau and Hawaii. Um, there's a way to learn about conservation firsthand um, when you interact at a, uh, with the communities. Uh, rather than telling is way more effective rather than uh, TNC staff um, telling. Uh, hearing it from community members themselves is a lot more powerful and effective. Uh, Third, it inspires and empowers communities when they return back home with uh, their new newfound uh, insights, um, and it fosters net networking and understanding, and heightens self-awareness of home and what needs to be done. And uh, so it's it's very different uh, from say a cerebral case study. You you actually get to see, feel, touch, and, and live it because you are there. Um, it's a learning changes or a visceral experience. That you're completely immersed in a, in a different thing, which affords you a different perspective, not only of how things are done differently elsewhere, but it gives you the time and space away from home to be able to reflect and sometimes see things differently and sometimes a little more clearly and, and bring some solutions home. Let's see. One of the outcomes also is you leave with a strong network uh, and, and a tight bond with the group, which upon reading home can spark action. Okay, kind of interest into learning exchanges. I, I'd like to hand it over to Steven for a quick, um, uh, kind of paint the picture for, for Palau. And text is there on why um, we felt a need to do a learning exchange with Hawaii. Look, we're, we can't audio for Steven. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give a few of us um, point slide. So, Palau. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you, Steven. Can, you can hear me. Yeah? So, I'll just yeah. give a brief uh, context of uh, Palau and why we had participants to come to Hawaii. So. Palau is a fairly small island, just uh, a little over 150 square kilometer square miles, and population is increasing. So there's 20,000 people, including over 100,000 uh, tourists uh, visiting Palau annually. Uh, and with open access to resources, there's a credible expectation that the uh, government manages the resources for everybody. And with uh, changes in lifestyle, uh, there's changes in values. So the traditional values of uh, communities managing own resources has been kind of weakening, and that really because of uh, individualism. We work for ourselves rather than for the good of the community. So 
na in the last uh, several years kind of lost of uh, ownership of resources for uh, Polan communities. Uh, that has recently been uh, trying to uh, uh, reinstate it. And so there are a lot of increased uh, challenges in, in, in management uh, that has led to a uh, decline in, in resources. So Palau has kind of become uh, just another uh, island that is adopted Western values and so the core Palau values uh, has been lost. So we want to bring... Uh, to a place where there's wide list of uh, ethnic, uh, people with different values and see how they match resources. And so how's a good uh, place that has experienced uh, rapid development uh, uh, that has led to the degradation of terrestrial and marine ecosystems. Uh, and there are examples in Hawaii where they're using uh, uh, are developing systems to protect uh, natural resources where they've lost uh, the resources and they're trying to restore them back. So th those were good examples to see uh, how it would be cheaper to manage than to restore resources. So those were the objectives. Uh, and there are good uh, watershed managers working to improve uh, and rehabilitate the ecosystem function. And so, looking at uh, how Hawaiian communities uh, are trying to revive uh, traditional uh, management approaches, because Palawans is starting to lose that. So we wanted them to get exposed to how it would be regained that once you lose it. So, while we have it, uh, we have it, we wanted them to try and hang on to those uh, uh, approaches and, and systems that still exist. Uh, Give it back to you, Manuel. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'll, I'll paint a picture of the, the modern context for Hawaii. And um, similar to Palau, high island ecosystem, uh, very biodiverse, extremely uh, uh, in endemism, but also very human pressures. Um, so if it's history, a lot of uh, the cultural traditions and, and ahupu management styles have been eroded. Um, and uh, has been kind of supplanted by a top-down centralized state resource management regime, uh, which works in some areas, but in some areas is inadequate uh, and ineffective to meet the challenges. As a result, kind of there's a very interest in, in, in management, uh, but so in, in many communities, this desire to revive and integrate traditional knowledge into the contemporary resource management. So that kind of that's the the picture and for um, for our trip to now, uh, given that context, we wanted to visit and learn from a place that kind of expertly makes traditional and modern management. Um, and so we saw that Palace sister site. Um, we want to demonstrate to our group from Hawaii firsthand, the benefits and values of Palau's community-established protected areas uh, network and to our local communities and decision makers. It's a great opportunity to bring together our community members, together meet and learn from each other, uh, share what they are doing in their communities in Hawaii, and meet key, and, uh, meet key TNC staff from other islands, as well as our decision makers that they know don't have face time with. Kind of, of an overview, um, we had uh, in January when uh, a delegation from Palau visited Kumi in Hawaii and Oahu, Maui, and Bay Island uh, learn uh, and experience how source management is done here in the face of rapid change and development, as Stephen said. And then the following February 2012, uh, 27 people from Hawaii, American Samoa, and the mainland U.S. visited Palau for learning exchange about um, how Palau does it. So, uh, quick break. 20 community members, uh, um, Hawaii, two delegates from American Samoa, and uh, 
by PNC folks from the U.S. mainland, including a film crew to do an educational program for middle school students. Now moving on to uh, best practice that we glean from from this trip. Okay, uh, we'd share with you some of the best practices that we learned from this trip. And again, they they are by no means exhaustive. Uh, they're sort of just what we learned from our experiences and what we wish we had better. There were some key practices that we thought um, needed done well in order to have a successful learning exchange. Uh, and I missed it uh, in the planning stages, basically before the exchange itself. And just importantly, the, the follow-through afterwards, after the trip. I um, hope you'll find some of these best practices instructive and useful if you're planning a learning exchange yourself. Okay. Okay, the first um, practice, number one, in the, in the pre-planning phase that we identified was be very, very clear on the purpose. What is the purpose of your learning exchange? And this pretty much sets the tone for the entire um, entire. In fact, without this very clear purpose, most likely won't get funding for this trip, which is a critical first step. But when you have this, um, uh, very important to have very clear uh, learning exchange objectives. And as an example, Stephen and I will go through our unique objectives. my turn oh sorry so for uh, Pala objective was to really go and learn what Hawaii has done in terms of uh, development that students can learn from in terms of what done but especially what not to do in an island system and there are examples of uh, uh, infrastructures that are not compatible with islands that have been uh, constructed in Hawaii and those were some things that uh, we wanted to see how they were and, and, and learn from how it could be adapted to fit the uh, Palau context. And then also look at the approaches in natural management in Hawaii, as Manila mentioned earlier, it's a uh, very top touch to management. Uh, and Palau, we have uh, kind of both. So we wanted to see how approach uh, works and how we marry the two together. And so that's what the uh, objectives for the Palau, Palawans going uh, to Hawaii. And back to you, Manuel. Thank you. For the um, Hawaii group visit Palau, we had three top uh, objectives. One was to understand Palau's resource management and conservation practices, especially when it comes to merging traditional with modern conservation management. So that was the first one. Second was to learn the key challenges and lessons in engaging with communities to gain support for conservation uh, in Palau. We wanted to close our group to start because they're they're about to embark and they're actively uh, doing community-based conservation. So we wanted to take them to a place that this is as well. And thirdly, we wanted to understand current efforts by the government and um, in Palau for conservation management of their natural resources. So it's um, with this being clear, it, it's also very, very important to communicate this with with our audience and kind of the clear objectives uh, then informs uh, both activities and audience who is coming. Next. So um, in terms of determine what activities we wanted to expose our group, group to visit uh, waters as well as marine sanctuaries that they could um, see and experience and see how it can run. Um, the, the objectives also kind of dictates who should be invited and who should come. And um uh, just had a few um, about how to how to select your group uh, participants, uh, and it's very important to note here that the right cast matters. It's 
uh, it's to have a good mix of backgrounds, genders, and different roles within that group. And we invest a lot of thought and care in, in the participant selection. Uh, it's important to strategically select uh, which decision makers, which influencers within the community, which leaders uh, should did. And because the demand for these trips are very high, seats are limited, and uh, a good way to kind of avoid hurt feelings in terms of the selection process is have your community group self-select within their communities based on objective criteria that they agree on. So that that takes the role of kind of handpicking which ones, but at the same time, we're very clear on the criteria. You know, and, and sometimes it's good to ask some good questions to consider in, in your group are, who is your audience? Uh, do you intend to influence? Who are the change leaders in this community? Who is this to the resources? Is it fishers, farmers, hunters? And lastly, which decision makers or legislators or businesses, landers, can kind of simplify the lessons when you get back home? So this is some things to to consider. And can you talk about the mix of the Palau delegation? Can add to that a little bit. So from a Palau's perspective, we kind of talk to the communities on what we would hope for the participants on this change to do when they come back home. So we gave them some criteria on how they would set participants, and mainly we want them to choose people who can influence, uh, as Manuel says. So when they come back, they can keep talking to communities. They bring the lessons, and then they spread it throughout the community. So. For we uh, worked with uh, our various partners to uh, select participants that uh, range from uh, national uh, congressmen to uh, fishermen to local uh, policymakers uh, and local women who uh, are influential in community activities. So we're hoping that by targeting them, they will bring the lessons and then they will target these different stakeholders uh, at the national uh, level, at the state level, and then the fishermen. When fishermen talk to fishermen, they more to the things they say when it is us talking to them, as well as women talking to other men within the community. So that's kind of how we uh, uh, selected the participants. And we, we shared to them that uh, it's not uh, a vacation trip. It is something that uh, you have to learn something and bring those things back, and so they uh, they they use those to kind of uh, talk with community members to ask them if they're willing and able to do these kind of things after they come back. Back to Manuel. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Uh, so just as the objectives inform uh, who's coming, um, they, they inform the activities and the site selection. So more planning, best practices. Um, so based on your group's needs and interests, um, uh, you can buy itinerary. And, and uh, like an easy to remember uh, an acronym is uh, the triple A <laughs> is um, access, accommodations, and attitude. And um, the first two are explanatory. But attitude is you want, you want to take your group somewhere where there is something to learn, where the community wants to share, and where they welcome you. Um, and also based on the host recommendations, uh, um, will meet our learning objectives. Uh, also, in your activities, uh, things to consider are the weather window. So we, we both planned this, but also lucked out that February is kind of the best travel month to January, February is the best travel month to Palau. Um, so with so much to do and so little time, you, you want to make each activity count and meaningful for your group, group uh, as well as the hosts in terms of the exchange. Um, so anything extraneous, just focus on each activity and make sure they they each contribute something to the objectives um, as well as spending time with the community. Okay, next slide. Um, more more plans. Um, this is a kind of a huge undertaking, especially when it, it reaches an international scale. There's a lot of logistics involved. Uh, from passports, travel arrangements, accommodations, ground transport, green fees. Uh, important to kind of um, 
make sure core team, you know, which is the internal and key planning partners group, stays on top of all of these um, details because uh, our job is to make sure the trip goes smoothly so that the group can focus on the learning. A solution for staying on top of the logistics is forming a core team both at the destination country as well as your internal planning team. Um, it's to get travel insurance. Um, because with a group this size and international, it's very expensive, so it's well worth insurance uh, cost. Okay. Uh, from Hawaii, because this is sort of the uh, first big one we've done, we had quite a team, but in hindsight, each person played a key role in terms of um, making the discussions happen. Uh, each person had a specific role was assigned to make sure that the distance about EAs and how you engage communities, um, how do you uh, engage landowners and uh, decisions happen. Uh, it the also keeps uh, this core team uh, also keeps the group back and focused um, and take problems as they arise. Okay. The next section is sort of a uh, trip while while you're traveling in the host country. Um, you know, as Steve did too, they they saw a lot of positive as well as negative effects in uh, of management in Hawaii. So, top lessons was provide both successes and challenges. You want to be realistic and uh, completely open and honest. Uh, show both the good and the bad. Uh, provide opportunities for discussion with communities in their community. Uh, and, um, you know, the two key points uh, are, you know, ensure reflection time and also provide opportunities for reciprocation for the visiting team. Next, please. So, um, yes, uh, in Rome, so follow the lead of your host and uh, observe local customs. And this can mean like dressing appropriately at the villages or at the legislature. Um, reciprocate. Um, uh, the group felt very strongly about this and a lot of them prepared something from their home, uh, from from this, to present to their hosts. Um, and, and all prepared with speakers. So for this group, we were very fortunate that we had uh, our Department of Land and Natural Resources Chairman, William Isla, as well as um, well-respected uh, uh, community leaders, Paul Kahohala, who, who kind of uh, served as spokespeople for the group, as, as well as Hile. So just being prepared to, to speak publicly on behalf of the group was, was uh, very important to have those key people. Important to provide opportunities for leaders to be able to interact and have discussions. And uh, about building time at the end of each day to reflect on the lessons. And, and this is sort of a threefold purpose. One, it allows for lessons uh, seen that day. Or could you um, to lessons to really sink in and be digested? by the group and by talking about it um, it helps really uh, digest and take some of the lessons home. Purpose is to help improve the trip as you go along. You know, how, what, what are things to improve upon? And and lastly, it's it's a great way to get strategic uh, communications and strategic actions identified from these uh, debriefs or these reflections at the end of each day. So during this, this is one of the best things to do is really Carve out time for um, reflection time. Next slide. Reflection uh, is afterwards when you get back home. Um, um, to stay in touch with with the group, you know you've come away from this amazing experience and you want to stay in touch. And that's one of the benefits is you enhance and stre strengthen kind of links between different communities across Hawaii. Um, Image of conferences and other events such as the Hawaii Conservation Conference, where 
uh, a lot of the Palau folks came to visit, so that was a great opportunity to get together with our with our hosts um, and share interests with your community. And um, by this, we kind of mean encourage uh, getting voice out in the media. You know, whether it's through writing of articles or doing interviews. I know they did an interview with NPR, um, but these, uh, these articles don't write themselves. So um, the key lesson we got from this is kind of staff time. And, and in this case, we were very fortunate. We had a communication specialist, Evelyn White, who assist um, in, in the creation of these articles, uh, as well as package press releases. So that's a lot of, uh, of carving out that staff time to get your messages out there. Please track uh, impacts if possible. And um, next slide, please. They track. We we kind of mean what are, what are the outcomes and measurements. And so, you know, in the field of conservation, the ultimate measures of success are biological. So things like abundance, species readiness, acres restored, no mass, etc. Um, for making, uh, you know, on an investment for trips like these, it's a little different because it's a little longer term uh, and. Um, you know, it's the way you know, we measure um, conservation success biologically, the way we get there is completely social and political. A few metrics that we kind of identified are things like how many strategic communication pieces did you get out there, whether it's news releases, uh, policy changes that resulted from this trip, minds changed among the community members that went along. Uh, were there network networks formed? Uh, did you find new champions? Uh, and this we had a, a um, world champion spear fisherman really champion the cause of community based management, which was great. Um, as well as uh, our own chef, the DLNR here, he, he was very, very supportive, which kind of inspired and empowered community members on this trip. And lastly, added capacity for these. Uh, Group they come a lot more productive and ideas and solutions and inspiration for taking care of their challenges. Okay. Next slide. In summary: uh, Those are just a few best practices that we've identified. Uh, your planning and the pre-planning will will pay off handsomely. It it makes for a smoother trip. Um, there are certain problems that will arise, but you'll you'll better prepared to handle them if you have a core team. It's well shared. Um, communicate your objectives and expectations clearly to your group, and take time to prepare your group. Uh, I would even suggest meet prior to the trip so people know what to expect, are comfortable with each other, they know what to pack, they know what to bring, what the customs are. Kind of sort of a pre-trip briefing, and then in terms of your planning horizon, um, I, I know this has been a five years in the making, uh, our, our director Kim Hom and Stephanie Ware put a lot into making this happen and um, and the plan really, t you know, when, when you have everything in place, the funding, um, it's not too early to start talking and start preparing for who's going to come. Uh, and for decision makers, you want to give them at least a three-month uh, head to, to clear their schedule and make sure they're available able to, to come with you. Um, and you need a core team to, to fully commit to this uh, and uh, be able during the trip, but overall learning objectives. Um, that's it for uh, best practices. Um, we would like to now hand it over to to he for for her reflections on the trip. Mahalo, um, aloha everybody in Cyberland, um, and mahalo to TV for coordinating this. Um, before I get into two specifics about less learned of the learning exchange, I, I just wanted to make a general statement that Palau is an amazing place, and I'm, I feel very fortunate um, 
to have been afforded the opportunity to go. I'm very flattered that I was selected to present in our community here in Hawaii. Um, I also would like to commend the Nature Conservancy for the job that they did. Uh, it is easy <laughs> to mobilize and then a trip such as this. So um, I think they did a wonderful job, and um, I'm very um, lucky that I was able to attend. Um, I just have some notes here, and much of what, what I, I'm, I'd like to share has already been articulated by Manuel, um, but I think where I come in um, is I come with these per perspective and often times um, um, for me in advance if, if I am candid and honest, I think that's one of the better attributes. So I'm um, going to start listing some of the lessons that, um, that I learned. One was, um, was that you know, when I was asked to attend um, to Palau, um, I really had no background. Um, just asked, hey, can you go to Palau? And, and of course, I made myself available. Um, and in hindsight, you know, I, I think that most us community um, representatives would like to um, be in a little bit more um, thing prior to us going. Um, maybe um, some an orientation meeting of, of what I suggested um, where you know those goals and, and the purpose of, of the learning exchange could be articulated um, to the community representatives so that everybody is on the same page. And um, also during orientation meeting I, I think making clear those expectations um, of of the community representatives um would in I think important. Um and making sure that the community representatives understand in full um what is expected of them. Um I just that, you know, all of those things should have been laid out prior to us going and then prior to T N C purchasing tickets um for for us as representatives. Um, uh, another another um, lesson that I learned, and this, this maybe didn't come up um, in my sharing, but um, in the work that in the work that I do here in the community, um, I'm I'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization, um, and folks associate my face and my name with the organization. Um, and which is the same with many other organizations and many other communities that we work with. Um, you know, when when selecting those representatives to to participate, I think ideally you want that that face to to attend and to to represent the community. But oftentimes, maybe that representative is able to to free a schedule or unable to attend. In which case. You know, um, ideally, if you could, if that representative could name someone else to go in their stead, wonderful. But um, I also think that in certain cases, um, you, you know, if that if that face or if that representative is unable to represent the organization, rather than scramble for someone to fill the spot, maybe the seat just doesn't get filled. Um, not all time is um, that particular individual um, able to be replaced. Just to consider. Um, also, the yeah, mission meeting would be beneficial um, for us as community representatives while in power is very important and even elsewhere to respect the host community and host culture. And much of that was um, exemplified through presentation of makana and gift giving. Um, but also I think where this might come into play is during the orientation meeting prior to going on the trip, um, preparing representatives for this through um, learning a couple of, of or chants um, or a couple of songs 
um, or you know maybe knowing knowing that that particular host culture is is maybe big on song and dance from a couple of individuals that are able to play music. Um, luckily, we had Uncle Saul with us, and um, maybe one sin that is able to dance hula. Um, the bed nice. Um, also, I think um, let folks know and letting representatives know that. Um, is their responsibility and an expectation to be a spokesperson on behalf of their host, on, on behalf of their organization, and on behalf of of um, our home, our home of Hawaii. Um, definitely, there were there were um, folks charged with that, like Uncle Saul and Uncle Bill, and at times myself. But it would have been nice. Um, to have had the opportunity to step up to the plate and amplify their leadership skills by um, by just being able to to articulate themselves in, in front of a group. I think that's a skill of all leaders of communities um, to learn. Oh, what else? Oh, I guess and and you know after the trip coming back. Um, there was initially when we first returned home, there was a lot of ask um, the Nature Conservancy for us to um, do talk shows or to appear on the news or to write a couple of articles. It was great, but soon after we returned, a couple of months later, that sort of slowly fizzled, and um, it sort of got to the point where I almost forgot my experience in Palau. Um, but getting opportunities to to engage with with um with those community representatives more, on a more regular basis, I think it could help help um, just move um, move um, things forward. Uh, one other thing I think I wanted to share was um was the importance of reciprocation uh, as far as um, folks here, our local, our local code here, um, the man, they, they wrote the red carpet for us when we, when we visited, and, um, and for, for me and my ohana and my community, reciprocation is so important. And so when, um, when some of our uh, Palawan hosts came to Hawaii for the Hawaii Conservation Conference in Chai, um us pulled together a, a gathering here at the fish pond. Um, you know, it's not a deal, but um, just, the, just the act of reciprocation um, allowing hosts away from the Waikiki scene, um, I think that act um, maybe went a long way. Uh, just being conscious of that reciprocation um, not in act action, but, but um, you know, one of my my big takeaways from the trip was just the food that I presented with, and and I, I talk about this a lot, and I really feel that the food that we were able to consume in Palau, um, the food that they harvested and gathered or grew themselves through food, and consuming of that food as visitors. It exemplifies the health of of both the resource and the community there in Palau. And so um, it's something for to strive for, but definitely uh, a beautiful sight to see um, a visitor to Palau, and something that I strive for here in Hawaii whenever we host hosters. Um, but Mao for allowing me to say words. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, so you can see the learning exchange uh, trips are are a big undertaking to to make run smoothly, uh, and this would not have happened without the support of um, a conversation. 
Washington, NOF Coral Reef Conservation Program, uh, Harold Dale Castle Foundation, the Maui uh, Office of Economic Development, Hawaii Fish Trust, and the, and the Nature Conservancy. So thank you for uh, and and uh, now. Um, thank you so much for presenting, um, Stephen, Hiile, and Manuel. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions for the presenters. And like I said, you can raise your hand and I can call on you, or you can chat with me or the host um, and send your questions. So um, go ahead. Um, if anybody has any questions, raise your hand and I, I can call on you. and. Um, we can go from there. I'll start with one question for um, in the planners. Will, um, would you guys say there's an ideal group size for this type of learning exchange? They can answer. Steve, yeah, any of the three of you can answer. First, and then uh, Manuel. I think. Uh, for uh, communities as Hawaii, where it's uh, so spread out, I think uh, the group that we took to 10, I think, was manageable because simply uh, logistic-wise, it will be a nightmare for the Hawaii program to do logistics having more than 10 people. But for now, where it's a small community, we pick up a phone and we drive maybe 10 minutes to where we want to be. I, I think. Uh, 25 was uh, good enough size uh, for us. So long as uh, there are also people within the group that are able to kind of take uh, people with that group and kind of uh, uh, help them uh, through the discussions and, and things like that. So that's my perspective. Of uh, it, it really depends on how complex the communities that take people to that kind of dictate how many people can we manage when we bring them in. Yeah. I agree with uh, Stephen. I think it's uh, bottom line is your budget. Um, but a you know, very practical uh, concern. It, you know, a big group like us, uh, we had to get a bus. Uh, and that's the difference between a, a bus rather than a van, having two boats or three boats sometimes rather than one boat. So from practical standpoint, uh, your budget will go up, the bigger the group, but um, in terms of kind of an intimate, uh, kind of nice group, I, I really like the dynamics uh, of our group, but especially of the Palau group as well, when they came to Hawaii, they were very knit and uh, very manageable for, for the hosts, and I'm sure we taxed our Palau hosts with such a big group. <laughs> All right, um, so I have a question from Mike Palmer. Mike, I'm going to um, call on you, so go ahead and ask your question. If I can get you muted. There. Mike? Can you hear me, Fetcher? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, the word budget was just mentioned, and uh, I work for the Nature Conservancy, and that was sort of going through the back of my mind during the presentation. And I'm not sure who's could answer this question, but I'm wondering how easy you found it to find money for this sort of thing, to find funders, and if, if and think that people who fund this sort of thing are okay with some of those intangible benefits, uh, touch upon that sometimes the benefits from these things aren't the class conservation, um, biological uh, that we can see, and if funders are becoming accepting of that, or, or if you think that that still has a ways to go. Great. And well, or, or Steve, do you want to try to answer and then I can chime in? Just give my perspective. Uh, since the uh, funding was already there for uh, the public, they came to Hawaii. So uh, uh, it was, uh, I couldn't say it was difficult to find uh, funding, but uh, since uh, this exchange, been able to secure funding for at least there's an exchange happening next week, and we just hosted an exchange. Uh, for, so it has been uh, kind of easy to can because uh, the, we've articulated uh, we've done conservation for 20 years in Palau, 
and the biological benefit is there. It's really the community hasn't really been able to experience those benefits. So you can see uh, where others are really struggling to ensure benefits make them more willing to do conservation. So how articulated uh, that to our funder has been uh, it's really moving conservation beyond just uh, pilot measures, but really measuring what people uh, can get and, and can experience that can further inspire conservation to move uh, ahead beyond uh, what we normally do. So it's been kind of easy for us to get funding for learning exchange that we've done uh, since the, the Hawaii exchange. Chime in really quickly. I think in the past it's it and, and it makes sense. In the future, it's hard to get these travel grants. Uh, in our case, we had some really good <laughs> funders uh, that were able to articulate our objectives. Um, you know, Mike, you mentioned some of the intangible benefits. I think one of the key things to stress when you're trying to fundraise for this is the powerful and catalytic nature of these, these trips. That you do get so much back. You know, both socially and politically. From these trips, they have such great potential to, to change things back home. Um, and perhaps going into the future, I, I think we would have done um, probably more specific about what metrics we used and to track those, you know, especially for donors that need to justify uh, learning exchanges. I, I know Petra, you have more experience in this, so. I don't. I don't. I want a lot of time for other questions, but I think it's a really good question, and um, I think we've been really lucky with a lot of support from um, certain members to give some from in exploring the potential of these learning exchanges in the past years. And it hasn't always been the case, and I think um, showing the outcomes is going to be critical to maintaining that kind of funding into the future. And that's because we wanted to start documenting these lessons better and communicating them so that we can keep, um, keep to get dollars for this type of work that we do feel really makes a difference, but that has those intangible outcomes. Um, and so I think another strategy behind the fundraising is if you see the different partners that I and Palau pulled together to make it happen, it's not just relying on one funder, and often um, they're able to to get support from, uh, like, Hawaii Trust to support one or two different members of the exchange. So it made it something bigger than um, originally envisioned. So piecing together once you have an initial idea can also be a strategy that can work. Um, some donors are more comfortable just sponsoring one or two participants. Um, I answered your question, but, Mike, please feel free to explore this more with the panelists, you know, over email and stuff if you're interested. Um, I want to call on, oh, oh, I thought there was another question. Um, okay, hold on. Let me get Ron. Where is it, though? Oh, sorry. My chat box. So I have a question from Rod Salm. Um, wants to know, have any real changes been made in resource management or partnership practices as a result of this exchange? I'll let, I'll go ahead, guys. Looking for the tangible. Uh, the tangible. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in, uh, in, there has been uh, a lot of changes. But it's always difficult to say it's because of this. It's because a combination of uh, different things, and this exchange has been one of them that uh, created some out of uh, strategy that uh, if you look at how things have been done, you can kind of see the aspect of the exchange that people have learned in the are doing things. So not 100%, percent you, you can Hundred percent, but then you can say there are things of what people think that related how they were exposed uh, to issues because of this learning exchange. Mm -hmm. Tangible benefit. 
much that I that I gleaned from the Palau delegate visiting Hawaii is that, that um, they were considering introducing goats to certain islands there, but once they saw the impacts of uh, feral ice on the south slope of Molokai when they, they flew over and they saw erosion, I think that changed the uh, decision, the uh, legislative minds in Palau. So I saw that uh, one concrete <laughs> Result and like Steve, it's it's kind of hard to attribute. Uh, in Hawaii, um, for sure, there is one to benefit is our communication link to the chair of the DLNR is wide open, and alone is kind of very very um, encouraging to the community members in terms of getting their rule packages prepared for him to uh, and the DLNR to review. So I think those are the two big things I got from this exchange. And add on to to that, I think one of the participants to the exchange to Hawaii was uh, a person. But prior to the exchange, he was uh, really to development, and he has a live uh, uh, fishing boat, and he wanted to develop uh, bubble dog. But when he to Hawaii, he saw how, how the impact wa were, and he actually wanted to. Uh, opportunities for his piece of land to be a conservation, and since they stopped uh, doing uh, the live uh, reef fish, and uh, he's not the, the big of a fisherman anymore, and he's reporting of conservation. I guess that's another very tangible uh, piece of uh, result that came out of uh, bringing this person to Hawaii. So. Yes. Um, I wanted to um so um as a current, I'm gonna call on him and see if he's willing to share. If he can Okay. Um. So a comment from Saul Kohalahala, who was another participant um on the exchange is that um, he supports the comments shared by Hi'ile coming from the community perspective, um, but he wanted to add that the cross-cultural mixing of the group left um, without proper knowledge and or protocol of our group members and also that of the host country. So he felt like it was one thing to be prepared to present ourselves in the exchange, but it's equally important to be prepared with the customs and practices a host. So that was a comment that from another community member who participated in the exchange. Um, I'll, are there any other questions? We're up out of time for our webinar, and um, I wanted to um, make sure I called on anybody who still had any questions. Um, but I think um, that's for now. And we like to stick on time for our webinars. So um, I wanted to thank our panelists again for uh, doing this presentation. There's a recording of this webinar as well as, as resource links um, that we're going to send out to the network list that we have after day. If you're not on our list of network members, um, you can email us at resilience at tnc.org to be on that list. And you can send us any suggestions for future webinar topics um, to that same email. Um, there are some resources on the slide you'll see on the screen um, in regards to this learning exchange and our panelists. And I also wanted to announce to those um, on the webinar right now that we are recruiting applicants for training for on reef resilience for coral reef managers. It's in the Western Indian Ocean and. So countries uh, managed from that region are eligible for the training, but if you have colleagues in the uh, area of the Western Indian Ocean, please notify them of that training opportunity. Applications are open now. And, um, again, thanks for participating in our webinar. We would like any feedback that you have for us. We do about six of these a year, and we're all always looking for topic ideas and how to make them useful to you as a participant. So look for more announcements on upcoming webinars in 2013. And thank you again.
Thank you.